so welcome to our uh, second colloquium of the, of the uh, academic year at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. Um, as usual, our event here will be a presentation and a Q&A, and then we will follow it with a, a, a reception on the fifth floor to which you're all invited. Um, so I'm really delighted to be able to welcome uh, Professor Brianna Toole here, who uh, we had hoped to see last year, but um, has finally made it. Yay. Um, and um, Brianna is um, a, an a still assistant professor, deserves to be full professor. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Grandma <laughs> Mechanical <laughs> is recording my institution. <laughs> uh, her research interests are in epistemology, philosophy of race and gender, and social and political philosophy. And um, she last year was a Lawrence Rockefeller Fellow at the Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Um, and for the past several years, she's been working to motivate and revitalize a thesis consigned to the margins of philosophy, standpoint epistemology, the view that non-epistemic features like one's social identity make a difference to what one is in a position to know. And she's published in Hypatia, Analysis, Philosophy Compass, the Journal of the APA, that's amazing. Very good, <laughs> hard to get in there. And um, she's currently working on a book project uh, on the subject related to her talk today. And it's called By the Roots and it concerns uh, sort of radical resistance um, with a long subtitle that I can't yeah. <laughs> um, And she's at, uh, Brianna is also the founder and director of Corrupt the Youth, a program that brings philosophy to high school age populations. That have been historically excluded from the academy. That seems so worthwhile. Um, and we're delighted to have you uh, come and give us your talk. Thank you very much. And the title is still the same, The Paradox of Resistance. Yeah, we haven't solved it yet. So maybe, maybe tonight. <laughs> I'm going to know what the paradox is exactly. And then I think we're in a better position to solve it. Okay, let me start my timer. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say I'm so sorry I couldn't make it in the spring. Uh, I felt terrible and I could have given the talk because it was written, but I would not have been my normal effervescent self to get to see today. Um, so I want to start by thanking Carol and Patricia for uh, having me out, for being here today. Um, and I just want to start by saying that I'm so glad that Henry is here, who I went to grad school with, because he can verify that what I'm saying is true. But my dissertation advisor and my placement director really drove into us this idea that every talk should be treated like a job talk. Uh, by which they meant like you should be so well prepared and so polished that at the end they should want to give you a job. Um, this is not going to be that. <laughs> I just like want to sort of prepare you for what you're going to get into. Um, this is a, a bit rough and unpolished uh, just because I'm thinking through some new ideas and because like a fool, please don't do this if you're grad students, like do not follow my example. I decided to rewrite my talk yesterday <laughs> um, from scratch just because I, I'm teaching these new courses and those new courses have generated some new ideas for me and sent me in some new directions. Um, and so I kind of wanted to explore how the talk would be changed in light of that. And so I apologize for the inf informality. Um, but my approach is that I don't want to talk at you. I want to think with you. Uh, and so because this talk is still sort of me figuring these ideas out, there is a genuine opportunity for me to like take very seriously your feedback. Um, so yeah, the subject of my talk today is what I'm calling the paradox of resistance. And so roughly I want to argue that, para that, that resistance is subject to a paradox in the following respect. Resistance pushes against the dominant or official world of sense. And I'm going to say what I mean by that world of sense business in a second. But really what I mean is that resistance tries to surface injustices that within the official world of sense either aren't seen at all or aren't seen as unjust. But resistance is subject to certain norms and it's constrained by certain forces that try to keep it within this official world. Now, if resistance remains within the official world of sense, I think it risks conferring legitimacy on that which is self-undermining precisely because resistance means to question the legitimacy of that world. But if resistance tries, as I think it must, to challenge that world, then from the point of view of that world, that resistance is gonna seem illegible or irrational. So this suggests to me that there's really only sort of one viable option for resistance, and that's to comply with the official world of sense, 
But again, as it's that world of sense that needs changing, resistance, when it's bound by this world, can't enact the radical change. So that's sort of the problem that I want to motivate and set up today. But to do that, I need to hit a couple of other points because this is a really robust and messy thesis. Um, so first, I need to say a little bit about how I'm conceiving of resistance at all. And then I also need to touch on this worlds of sense business because a lot of what I want to argue hinges on how I'm cashing out. And then with those two major pieces of the project out of the way, I can say a bit more about how resistance is placed in a kind of double bind in which it is either illegible or it's self-undermining. And how this is what generates the paradox in which resistance is ultimately forced to legitimate the very systems that it's. And so if there's time remaining, and there probably won't be, uh, I may be able to touch on how I think resistance can get outside of and potentially resolve this paradox. But that's the plan for today. Uh, so let's start by talking a little bit about resistance. So when I say resistance, I want to get clear first that I mean something much broader than civil disobedience. Uh, and I want to make that clear because I take it that when people talk about resistance, they tend to be thinking in terms of civil disobedience. And as an aside, I want to flag that the distinction here is really important because while resistance shouldn't be subject to the norms of civil disobedience, it very often is. So what I have in mind when I talk about resistance, I want to include things that range from the pretty moderate, like the Women's March on Washington following the inauguration of President Donald Trump, to the more radical, like the Just Stop Oil climate activists. You're definitely familiar with these people. They're the ones mock destroying art by throwing like tomato soup on it. They also just interrupted a stage production of like Miz. Uh, if you haven't seen the clip, it's hilarious <laughs> because like, you know, Les Mis is about these people protesting and then the people get so upset that protesters are interrupting the play. <laughs> it's just, the irony is beautiful. Um, but I also want to include things like riots as a legitimate form of resistance. And so essentially what I have in mind here is what Candace Delmas calls principled uh, or uncivil disobedience, which particularly emphasizes those acts that don't claim to be and don't aim to be civil. And so this distinction between civil and uncivil disobedience is significant because resistance, unlike civil disobedience, aims to reject the system's legitimacy. That's like a key distinction. Of course, just like with civil disobedience, in the case of resistance, it's not the case that just anything goes. Rather, resistance has to be engaged in principally, uh, with principled motivation. So it must be politically or morally motivated in its refusal to conform to the system's dominant norms. Now, beyond Dalmas, who I do think offers a, a really helpful analysis of resistance that I make some use of, I'd largely think of resistance as a pretty distinctively epistemic practice. So here I'm making use of Jose Medina's arguments and the epistemology of resistance. And so as Medina writes there, resistance must puncture epistemic ignorance and pierce through social blindness, apathy, and insensitivity. Now, it does so primarily by generating what he calls epistemic friction, which forces an epistemic shift. And here, I almost always liken resistance to a gestalt shift. So just like we have to toggle our vision to see the dual images in a gestalt, resistance requires a similar toggling to change how we see the world. It's in this respect that resistance constitutes a kind of epistemic disruption. And so what I mean here is that Resistance is meant to dislodge the assumptions and value frameworks that guide our daily life so that we come to see things in a new way. And so here, um, you know, the philosopher of education, Kathleen Knight Abowitz, is, is particularly instructive. She writes that the aim of resistance is to undermine the reproduction of oppressive social structures and social relations. And so ideally, what resistance does is it prevents reproduction of the social world as it has. So think about uh, French philosopher and social theorist, Louis Althusser's work. He argued that every social formation reproduces the conditions of its own production. And so we need to think of our society as a kind of social formation in which everyone has a part to play. Teachers train our next generation of workers. Those workers go on to pro uh, produce products that we consume and so on. Now, just like the products we consume have to be produced, so does, so too does that social formation that we're a part of. And that social formation requires certain, you know, certain conditions to produce it. 
the more that those conditions are disrupted, the more difficult it is for that social formation to be maintained and reproduced. And so ultimately what we ought to think of resistance as is this you know, oppositional positioning in relation to dominant power and ideologies that seeks to challenge those structures towards liberatory. Now, it's in virtue, this pedestal, there we go. It, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's in virtue of the disruptive capacity of resistance though that our perspective has shifted. And so we come to notice what before we had been oblivious to. So the idea here is that epistemic friction produced by resistance generates something phenomenologically similar to a gestalt shift so that we come to see as unjust states of affairs that we may not have properly attended to before. And it's in this respect that I think we can understand resistance as a world piercing practice. So if a political system is like a bicycle, resistance is like poking a stick in the wheel. It prevents the will from continuing to turn. It disrupts the reproduction of those unjust states of affairs. Now, it's precisely because I'm thinking of resistance as serving a disruptive function that I worry about it being constrained to this official world of sin. And so here, I actually just want to talk a little bit about what I mean by world. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Maria Lagones's work, she introduces the, the terminology of worlds in her book, Pilgrimages, Peregrinajes, I think I said that right, Theorizing Coalition Against Multiple Oppressions. And actually, I want to spend a little bit of time here situating the concept in her work, because she does such a beautiful job of making clear what worlds are and why they are significant to the kind of projects that resistance is engaged in. So the other reason I want to appeal to worlds here, though, is I think it makes it really clear why we need to think of resistance as a, as a distinctively epistemic practice. So the language of worlds in her work appears in the context of understanding why there's been a failure of solidarity with women. And she really cares about analyzing this failure of solidarity because she thinks this failure of solidarity, this, fa this failure to love each other, leads to a failure to challenge the oppression that we experience qua women. And so one of, the, one of the initial answers that she gives in the text is like, look, we're not able to be in solidarity because we've been taught to arrogantly perceive each other. And in particular, white women are going to arrogantly perceive women of color. And what this means is that this arrogant perception disrupts our capacity to identify with each other. So what happens is that white women do see women of color as oppressed. And they don't want to identify with them because to identify with them would be to identify with their oppression. And so to quote Luganas here, she writes, to some extent that we face each other as oppressed, we do not want to identify with each other. We repel each other as we are seeing each other in the same mirror. And so her solution to this is that, you know, we need to cultivate this capacity to world travel, to visit each other's world. So what does she mean by world traveling and worlds? Well, to suss it out, she does this other thing. My students really struggle with this paper, and I loved it so much. Um, she introduces this concept of playfulness. And what she notes, you know, really what she observes is that in some worlds, she's constructed as a playful being. But in other worlds, she's constructed as being not playful. And so she asks, how is it that I can both have and not have this attribute? And her solution is, well, I'm in different worlds. There are some worlds in which, you know, I am playful because I feel at ease, but there are other worlds in which I'm not constructed as playful because I'm not at ease in those worlds. And so ultimately in an oppressive world, she may not be seen as playful. And what she's asking for is for women, you know, other the women who view her arrogantly to travel into the worlds where she sees herself as she is, as a playful being, so that they can see her for who she is, as she is, and not through the context or not through the lens of a world that views her um, as not playful, that views her in a way that she is not, or that she doesn't understand herself to be. Now, Lugona is in talking about worlds here. She leaves that terminology pretty deliberately underdefined, but she does have a few concrete things to say. And so I'll touch on those in a minute, but I'm going to flesh out the concept a bit more here. I want to try and put some meat on its bones so that I can make really clear why I propose thinking of resistance in terms of its world piercing path. So it might help to think about worlds 
in terms of what Patricia Hill Collins has called the outsider within. Um, how many of you are familiar with that? Okay, okay. So Patricia Hill Collins wrote this book, Black Feminist Epistemology, Black Feminist Knowledge. Um, and one of the things she talks about is this concept of the outsider within. So she sort of observed that Black women sociologists tend to be, that they seem to have a better time sort of challenging the assumptions that guide sociological work. They seem to have a better time proposing alternative interpretations of the data that they're collecting. And so she's trying to figure out, you know, what it is about Black women's positioning that enables them to do the sociological work in the way that they do. And so to draw this out, she starts by looking at the position of Black domestic workers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, as a way to sort of draw out the knowledge base of Black sociologists. And so here's what she says about the Black domestics that she's looking at. Black domestic workers are outsiders to the white world but they are permitted within that world via their position as domestics. But the converse relationship doesn't hold. That is the white folks for whom black domestic works are not going to and don't need to travel into the world of the black people they employ. And so this results in a sort of asymmetry of knowledge where black folks will for the most part know much more about the white world than white people will know about the black world that they don't have to travel into. And that's largely just because black folks and anyone who's marginalized really is constantly being forced to travel into what we want us. But if you're a dominantly positioned person, that burden is less likely to appear for you. Now I introduced Collins here because I think of worlds as the beliefs, values, assumptions, intuitions that sort of guide and structure our day-to-day -day interactions and living and engagement with the world. Uh, as an aside, um, I do want to note, in case this is helpful for anybody else, my students sort of connected Lugones on Worlds with the idea of code switching. I don't think that's exactly right, but I do think the concept of code switching helps illuminate what by worlds. Because if you observe someone code switching, that tells you that they've left their world and they're in a world where they know that there are certain expectations about how they should comport themselves. There are certain expectations about how they should speak and appear. So just by observing like when people code switch, you can see when they've left their world and traveled into another one. So what I think this tells us is that worlds are just those taken for granted assumptions and expectations that we must even be aware of in order to code switch successfully. So worlds are, and I quote Lugones here, descriptions and constructions of life, as well as constructions of the relationships of production, for example, of gender, race, and so on. So ultimately Lugones concludes, and I, I think this is right, worlds are epistemological, so they set the limits on what we know and what constitutes knowledge, like what can be known, but they're also ontological. They shape and structure who we are and what we can be, how we conceive of and relate to ourselves. And so I think of worlds as providing a kind of epistemic orientation towards the world. Worlds are like, or, or at the very least, they sort of provide an epistemic frame. Uh, they help direct our attention. They provide schemata for interpreting and making sense of what we see. Essentially, they help us make meaning of the world. Um, I'm teaching freshmen this semester too, and we're starting to get into Lagonas and we're thinking about the challenges that resistance faces in you know, communicating one set of needs to a body that might not understand those needs. And the whole idea of epistemic frames, ideology really troubles them. And what I tell them is like, you, you can't live without the stuff. Like you literally can't function without epistemic frames, without a world, without an ideology. Because otherwise we would just be so overwhelmed with information for which we have no category, you know, categories, no classifications. Uh, and so the real task isn't to get outside of these ideologies, right? It's to figure out how to be attentive to the badness in them that leads to this, you know, wrong interpretation. Um, but here's, here's sort of the issue for resistance. The world, some worlds are official. This is the, the language that Lugon uses, and others are unofficial. The world of sense of the dominant, the powerful, the elite, that's the official world. Official worlds are just those that are sanctioned, endorsed, taken for granted, assumed. You know, the official world is the world. The, what that world notices, that's what's real. And what that world overlooks doesn't exist. 
that world's interpretations are the interpretation. So the problem is that resistance is speaking from outside of this official world. Resistance emerges out of the experiences and grievances of the marginalized, the oppressed. And so it is voiced from worlds that are unofficial, worlds that in fact may be in tension with the official world. So think back here to how Lugones is constructed in ways that are in tension, playful and not playful. In much the same way, resistance might be trying to express, some, express something that from the point of view of the official world can't get traction, doesn't make sense. But resistance, though it speaks from the world of the unofficial, must be expressed to those who, who are in the official sense, whose meanings and inter interpretations may not only fail to make sense of what the marginalized are communicating, but may deliberately misrepresent or misconstrue their expression. So essentially the problem is this. If the official world of sense is comprised of and is sensitive to the experiences and insights of those who are dominantly positioned, then folks within that world may not be able to see what the marginalized. And this is why I think resistance is best construed as a radical and distinctively epistemic practice, because resistance is trying to make visible what, from the point of view of the official world, is invisible or unremarkable. The resistance is ultimately trying to sort of shake us out of our participation in the official world, and to move us into a world that allows us to see what those engaged in the practice of okay. All right, so to recap what I've done so far, I've argued that resistance aims at disrupting the official world of sense, a world that doesn't recognize an injustice as unjust or doesn't see it at all. In order to allow us to see what resistance aims to draw our attention to, it cannot operate within that world that has made their suffering invisible or normalized. So essentially my claim is that resistance is a form of critique, one that must take place outside of the official world and cannot take place within the official world. Now, my contention is that the official world of sense constructs a sort of double bind for resistance. And it is this double bind that places resistance in the paradoxical position of having to legitimate the very thing it seeks to dismantle. And so fall, oh, I'm short of my time. Okay. <laughs> uh, so following uh, Sukhina Hirji here, I want to define double binds as a choice situation where no matter what an agent does, they become a mechanism in their own approach. And I thought, <laughs> I know what a double bind is, but when I try to talk to my students about it, if I don't have examples in my pocket, I will just not be able to define it. So I have two examples that I wanted to share with you here that I use with my students, and so I think will be helpful if other people have this problem. Uh, so the first example came up in the context of, you know, philosophy of language and porn, so sort of Ray Langton's work. And the idea here is that porn constructs women such that if a woman says yes, she means yes. But if a woman says no, she also means yes. So essentially the way porn constructs women is such that their refusal is not possible. Um, the second example emerged in the context of Herman Melville's Benito Sereno. Are y'all familiar? Yay, I love talking about Benito Sereno. Okay, my students really hated this. It's a short novella um, that he wrote in what, 1859, I think is the year of publication. It's crunchy is the language that they would use. Lots of long sentences with tons of commas. Um, but Charles Knowles references it in his piece, White Ignorance, because it's this really excellent illustration of how we can buy into an oppressive ideology and then fail to see the world outside of that ideology, even when it's like kicking us in the face. So the idea behind Benito Toreno is that there's this ship carrying slaves. It's gotten stuck at sea. Another ship led by an American you know, happens to be nearby and goes to help them. This American captain gets on the Spanish ship and he's like, oh, shit's weird here. Something is not right. But he can't put his finger on it. And if you're reading, you're like, oh my God, the slaves are not acting the way that we are taught slaves are supposed to act. Like something here is off. It very much has the tenor of a Jordan Hill horror movie. So, so they know, you know, my students know something's off, but halfway through the book, I managed to convince them that really the Spanish ship was pirates. When, spoiler alert, I'm sorry to ruin it for you, what's actually happened is that the slaves managed to lead a mutiny and take over the ship. And all the ev evidence of this is sort of confronting our American captain in the face, and he literally can't see it because, as he says over and over again, 
oh, you know, Negroes are just too stupid. You know, Negroes love to be servant. They love to be good friends. He literally at one point compares them to Newfoundland dogs, right? So what my students were grappling with is like, but, yet, but they constructed this ideology so that there's no way that the American captain could see what's going on. And so the double bond we were able to pull out of that is this. If slaves show their discontent, they're whipped. All right. So then that means slaves have to act like they're happy. But if slaves act like they're happy, then they will be assumed to enjoy their servitude. So there's no actual, you know, option for slaves to express their discontent being, you know, enslaved. So what we see in both examples is that the oppressed person is made to be complicit in their oppression. With respect to resistance, I think the double bond presents itself like this. If resistance is done outside the official world, as it ought to be if it wants to achieve its aims, it will be rendered illegible by that world. And if resistance is instead performed from within that official world, then it cannot achieve the radical epistemic disruption that it seeks. So here's how I think this double bond gets off the ground. First and foremost, the purpose of the, of the double bond is to keep resistance within the official world of sense. Now that world is likely to, and I think this is probably empirically verifiable um, for what it's worth, it's likely to be hostile to resistance, precisely because it's troubled by the possibility of being dismantled through this resistance. And so I think this world is gonna contain certain safeguards to make sure that resistance can't actually accomplish that dismantling. So for instance, I think resistance will often be constructed so that it seems irrational from the point of view of the official. Uh, so to return for a moment to Lugones in another chapter, she discusses how women's anger doesn't get uptake in the official world of sense. And the reason for that is that anger positions you as an equal. But within the official world, women are not constructed as equals. As such, their anger isn't legible because anger positions them in such a way that the official world of sense precludes. And so what this means is that the official world is going to construct women's anger as irrational, or it's going to force them to perform that anger in a way that's recognized by and will get uptake in the official world, which is to say, not at all. So the messaging is clear. Don't be angry. Now, the official world of sense will, in a likewise manner, construe resistance so that it's either unintelligible or in such a way that it is consistent with the values of that official world. And here, I think, really, the best way to sort of motivate this is to look at some examples where this is actually. Uh, so to start, uh, consider ideological misrepresentations of the civil rights movement. So Candace Delmas and Aaron Panetta both discuss this very beautifully. And what they note is that this, the civil rights movement is often misrepresented as being less radical than it was, as valorizing docility, and it serves to demand of the oppressed what Juliet Hooker calls democratic exemplarity. So essentially, the ideological account of the civil rights movement as entirely nonviolent and non-radical and as committed to nonviolence for moral reasons, serves counter-resistant purposes. And so here's, here's what I mean here. Um, people often interpret King as the primary leader of the civil rights movement as being committed to nonviolence because he was like morally committed to nonviolence. But in truth, when you look at some of King's writings, he was committed to nonviolence for strategic reasons. He knew that nonviolence would appeal more to the white majority that he needed to convince. Uh, and so he pursued, you know, nonviolence for strategic reasons, not for principled moral. Now, the reason we should think of this too as counter-resistant is that it allows for the civil rights movement to be represented as endorsing the legitimacy of the operative political system. Another thing that does not actually reflect the spirit and tenor of the civil rights movement. King was also very clear that he did not endorse the legitimacy of the system. And I sort of think we can sort of, we see this every year on MLK Day with the whitewashed anesthetized remembrances of Martin Luther King. But I think what, what needs emphasizing here is how in order to view black people as moral agents worthy of care, the official world demands of black people that they peacefully acquiesce to law rather than show their very justified anger. And the reason for this is pretty clear if we understand anger as Lugones does as a moral emotion that positions one as an equal. In rejecting anger as a legitimate response to oppression and demanding exemplarity in the face of loss, 
The official world maintains a social hierarchical positioning in which black people have to petition to white people for repair. Now, I want to flag here that this is exactly the paradox that I want to draw attention to. Uh, this kind of position, petitioning leaves the racial hierarchy intact when that hierarchy is the very thing that the civil rights movement would have been working to dismantle. So to sum up this example, I think ideological misrepresentations of the civil rights movement that whitewash this movement serve both to police contemporary resistance movements, as well as to offer a version of the civil rights movement that pacifies the official world. It gives a version of the civil rights movement that doesn't actually challenge or put the positioning of the official world as the official world. Let's look at a more recent example. Um, I'm sort of obsessed with All Lives Matter um, as a response to the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I want to think a little bit about how this claim functions. So first and foremost, Black Lives Matter, I do think, represents an attempt to step outside of the official world of sense, especially because what it does is it centers a particular issue within the Black community, namely police brutality and the policies like qualified immunity that protect law enforcement agents from responsibility for their work. Now, Black Lives Matter aim to assert an obvious but not yet made true fact that Black lives matter and have value and should be treated as such. The claim really was just a way to express a plea to recognize our humanity and a call to acknowledge that the actions of the state deny that humanity. So let's ask then what All Lives Matter could have been up to. So elsewhere I've argued that All Lives Matter serves as a form of misdirection. This is a political tactic that diverts attention away from the injustice that is the subject of resistance by providing as a distraction a distorted version of the demand that agents of resistance are making. So essentially, like all lives matter made a part of the common ground a distorted reading of Black Lives Matter. They made the common ground understanding only Black Lives Matter. So here we have a pretty clear case of the official world rendering an act of resistance irrational. And the reason it would be irrational is this. Black Lives Matter, in saying Black Lives Matter only, would have to be engaging in the exact kind of hierarchical value placement that white supremacy is. And so it would be contradictory for them to do that and to just, I mean, the, the phrase I use in my paper is it would be white supremacy and black faith in order to, to engage in that kind of flip value system. Uh, and so if that's what they were doing, they would sort of be hypocritical in their own aims. But beyond this, let's take All Lives Matter seriously for a second and try to understand it as a, a legitimate critique. Let's say that folks in this camp were genuinely suggesting that All Lives Matter should have been the mantra and not Black Lives Matter. Consider how this would keep us within the official world of sense. One, it avoids centering the target, that Black lives are under attack. It avoids drawing attention to the racialized nature of this harm. And it fu functions as a form of colorblind ideology that prevents victims from being able to address the sort of harm. I mean, it's really hard for me to see how All Lives Matter could possibly even have been effective given what Black Lives Matter was trying to do. But it definitely does preserve the values of the official world and that it decenters Black lives and so leaves that racial hierarchy intact. All Lives Matter really serves to function as a way of ignoring the problem that motivated Black Lives Matter in the first place. Yes, all lives do matter, but it's the Black ones under attack right now. So just like um, with Lugones' anal Lugones analysis of anger, then, we see that for Black people trying to draw attention to injustice perpetuated by the state, their resistance will either be rendered irrational or performances will be demanded that conform with the value of the official world. Uh, but essentially, as we can see with the pivot to All Lives Matter, that would be to not resist. Which, for the record, is what I think they're ultimately trying to get at. Put that for a separate page. All right, so these examples allow me to draw out the double bond that resistance faces. Resistance tries to push against the official world of sense. Resistance will be, you know, conceived or constructed as irrational. So this means that resistance has to comply with the values of the official world. But as that's the thing that needs changing, when it's bound by that world, it can't achieve radical economic disruption. So if resistance aims to disrupt official worlds of sense, worlds that hide or normalize injustice, then to demand that resistance operate within this world undermines the aim of resistance. So roughly, I think the construction of this double bond is a way of setting the terms for debate. 
ensuring that those who resist must still comply with the very elements of the world that they wish to draw out and dismantle. Now, of course, if resistance remains within this world, the world of sense of the dominant, then paradoxically, it risks conferring legitimacy on the, on the beliefs and values. to tell us how to get out of this. Oh, <laughs> how much time do I have left? <laughs> oh, God. Okay, let's see what I can do. All right. So real quickly, I want to talk about the paradox more explicitly and what I mean by legitimation, because that's sort of the part that I think makes me anxious. Uh, so what's left to be addressed is how I'm being constrained by the official world of sense resistance is made to confer legitimacy on or to endorse that. And so here, I think we need to ask two questions. First, what does it mean for X to legitimate Y? And then second, how would operating within the official world confer legitimacy on it? So to answer the first, we can think of legitimation in terms of what Ashani Matra calls licensing authority. So when we conform with a person who exerts authority, it's our behavior, it's our, conf our, our conformity that gives them their authority. That we comply with their demands signals that we accept their authority to issue. Fans. So I was going to give you all this fun wedding example, but I think I'm just going to stick with my Shawnee Matrix hiking example because it's really effective. But the idea is like, imagine like the group of you are organizing a hike and y'all are like, well, where are we going to go? What time are we going to leave? What time should we get back? And then you just stand up and are like, you know what? All right, we're meeting here. We're we'll meeting this time. We're we'll meeting here. Just by standing up, taking charge, and them defaulting to you, you, you've, you've got authority. They've licensed your authority. But the point with that kind of licensing is that in virtue of complying with the demands, you've legitimated the demands, right? The same is, I think, true of resistance. When we're forced to comply with the official world of sense, we're sort of sending a signal that we like endorse that role. And I think too, um, Ray Langton offers a pretty account uh, perhaps even more useful account of legitimation in this particular case. Um, he argues that to legitimate something is to represent it in a particular way, namely to represent it as normal. Now, as I've said, the official world is not the only world. There are unofficial worlds, worlds that those who engage in resistance occupy. But to demand of resistance that it be performed from within the official world is to force resistance to treat that world as the world that matters as the world that is normal, as the world that is right. And so when resistance complies, that is when it does operate within that official world of sense, it signals that it endorses that world. Thus the double bind ultimately serves the function of limiting the only possible options for resistance to those that will not ultimately challenge or displace the official world. And that this means that resistance is often only able to engage in minor repair rather than the kind of radical reform that would destabilize the official world and allow for new worlds to be imagined. So that's where I had planned to end, but Carol wants me to say a little bit about how I think I would resolve this paradox. Um, so it's not gonna sound all that impressive, but I really think it is when you consider what, how robust this thing is. Um, consciousness or anything, I think, is a big part of the solution. Um, I find it horribly upsetting that as a, as a, as a political practice, consciousness raising has been on the decline. And I think, I don't know if you all feel this way, but it seems like people are just much less socially in contact with each other. And I don't think that serves our interest. I think it serves the interest of the powerful because when you can't meet and be in spaces with each other, then you can't share things, you can't locate your similar grievances, which means you can't figure out that there's a problem you all share to be organizing for. Um, but I think part of what consciousness raising does, we in my class, we've been reading Catherine McKinnon on this, Kathy Sarah Child, uh, who's a fascinating figure. Um, Y'all don't know her. Okay, let me talk about Kathy Sarah Child. Kathy Sarah Child gave this talk at the Women's Convention in 1968. And what I find fascinating about her is that she's for real about throwing off the patriarchy. So she got rid of her patriarchal last name and she took her mother's name as her last name. So Sarah Child, Sarah is the name of her mother. Get it? Sarah's child. I think that's so cute. Anyhow, <laughs> um, what we've been learning though about consciousness raising is that it's not necessarily about you know, burning everything to the ground. What consciousness raising does is it gets you to step outside of your world so that you start to notice the outlines of it. It's basically a way of coming to see your pain. 
And I think the reason that the official world of sense is hostile to resistance is because we are trying to affect change within the official world when what we need to be doing is drawing attention to the limits of that world so that collectively we can participate in this project of world. Um, I can't imagine why a privileged person would want to take resistance seriously when they can't yet see for themselves the ways in which the world of sense is hurting them and 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 constraining them. So for instance, um, I know the Barbie movie was like really controversial. <laughs> um, philosophers can't enjoy anything, I swear. <laughs> but Barbie kind of was good in that it did get some men, I think, to start thinking about how much patriarchy sucks for them. You know, before we advocate for something really radical, the first step is just to get people to see this. Um, so I know that doesn't seem all that radical, but I think that's exactly why it might be radical, because it's like, here's this obvious thing we need to be doing. There, There's lots of work on it available to us, and we just sort of neglect uh, so yeah, I think um, I will end there. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks for this great talk. I really enjoyed it. There's a lot of great stuff there. I think one my question is just I wonder if it um, your argument depends too heavily on the idea that there is one dominant mm -hmm. mode of sense. I mean, even with like the example of like um, Black Lives Matter. I mean, sure, there's an All Lives Matter. That um, it's probably it's that discourse is I don't know I have no idea but it, that that discourse was probably worked by the Black Lives Matter discourse that generated some of the largest protests in U.S. history. So it's sort of like so are you just overemphasizing this idea of this one dominant world of sense? And there may be multiple dominant worlds, or or given where we are right now, post various protests, the civil rights movement, gay rights, on the rights, like sort of like the world of sense is fractured in many ways, in many different ways, right? So that like there is no one dominant world of sense that needs to be undermined insofar as there is one world that is like still one world of sense that is very bad and oppressive, right? Um, I'm not sure that those are the people that need to be reached anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, did the civil rights movement have to change everybody's mind? No, it had to change a certain number of people's mind, and the rest of people just had to roll and die. The next generation comes along. <laughs> I'm curious, like, yeah. do you have to do you have to overturn the entire dominant world sense? But maybe there's also you know, one singular dominant. Any other questions? I love this question, and I have a response to part of it, and then to the other part of it, I have to think. You're definitely right. I don't think there is one official world any more than there's one official world. Um, this is part of the challenge of organizing at all, even. One of the constraints that Rawls introduces on civil disobedience that I wanna keep for resistance is that you have to organize with people who have similar grievances, but people who have similar grievances also view each other antagonistically, right? So like that in itself is a problem to overcome. So. My account in focusing on one official world is simplifying what is definitely a more complex problem. Um, and I do want to think about what that means for how resistance is plotted. But to your question about who is resistance meant to speak to, um, this may not, have, yeah, this probably didn't come out in my discussion of the civil rights movement, but as someone who is here 60, what, 60 years later? I find myself really frustrated with the civil rights movement. Um, like just set aside the sexism and misogyny that was rampant among these civil rights leaders. I'm frustrated that they weren't more radical. Like I kind of, I find myself thinking like if y'all had just dealt with this then, we would not be here now. Uh, and the problem is actually sort of that attitude of like they're gonna grow old and die. It turns out they grow old. Some of them just don't die. All right. <laughs> when we were talking about this like, like how is what's his face still alive? I don't get it. Dick Cheney. Yeah. How? How is that possible? Um, but the other thing is, and I sort of see, saw this in the small town I grew up in, it's amazing how well those folks manage to preserve their belief system and to pass it on to someone else. And so the civil rights movement pursued what it thought was probable, but not possible. And I think it should have pursued the possible. So like 
why are we now having a debate about textbooks in Florida saying that slaves were just happy and happy? Well, because we didn't get that shit in the button. I also realized that this is like not an unfair, this is an unfair critique to lob at them. Like they they did what they could in the time that they had. Um, but I do think if resistance is going to be radical, it does have to sort of go for everyone. As like it has to it has to invest us all in this project of rebuilding. That means you've got to get even David Duke and his godson. His godson has the record. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't fully address your question, I don't think. Uh, but I do want to I, I do want to think about more what it means to engage in resistance that it's outside multiplicity. I could see how resistance might be outside of official world A, but within official world B. Yeah, that's interesting. I think more concrete examples would help me appreciate that problem. Yeah, so thanks for your question. I don't think my question is fully formulated, so maybe <laughs> we can think through it together. Um, and it's sort of going along with um, the issue that Jeff raised, which is sort of my initial reaction to, that there is no one dominant or official world. Um, and yeah, just as oppressions are heterogeneous, so are forms of privilege. Um, and one idea that comes to mind is that resistance is a process mm -hmm. and that what that there are multiple kinds of disruptions and different kinds of disruptions that need to happen depending on where people are situated. Um, and like different forms of like articulating things are going to speak to certain groups and not others. Um, the other idea based on what you just said is like maybe the distinction between like reformist and non-reformist reforms could be helpful yeah. in thinking through, um, yeah, the what sorts of changes are strategic and will help us in the long term dismantling and which appeals to the official world of sex are strategic and will help in the long term dismantling and which appeals will actually sort of re-entrench us in all and I guess a third dimension not to throw too many things at you <laughs> so you can just comment on it if not um what do you think about the material underpinnings of ideology and the epistemic um, dimensions that you're talking about? Just because I think that um, you mentioned interests at one point mm -hmm. and um, thinking through people's actual experiences with a system of domination and sort of appealing to those real experiences, reframing them um, is, is one way to go about it. Um, but that can be easier said than done based on what your material is. Yeah. So I hope that's all sort of clear. Ooh, so, okay, yes, that was a lot. I'm trying to figure out how to... I like... I really like this idea of thinking about reform and not working. Because there is a sense in which what the civil rights movement was doing was trying to convince white folks to care about racial justice because it was consistent with the values they claimed to endure. Um, and so you might think there they are operating on the entity because in the official world of sense because they're aiming for some kind of minor repair that can be achieved in the official um, I guess what I really want to drive at is I think a lot of oppression this is because i'm an epistemologist i can't not understand the problem in epistemic terms but i think of a lot of oppression as epistemically based it's because we have certain beliefs about what people are like and who has value or we rank them in certain and so what the civil rights movement from did for me still wasn't enough because it allowed for the epistemic construction of black morally and intellectually inferior to remain unchanged that's not something that I wanted to say to Jeff. Um, 
But you could understand resistance as being on this real long continuum where before its movement did their beaks and now we're here today. And our job is to pursue this more radical level because we're now in a position where we um Part of me wants to say that I'm okay with that. I'm not okay. <laughs> I'm not okay with that. I think what you should be pursuing at all times is like undermine the idea. Um, what I want to ask you about though is what you, if it can you can you say a little more about your, the last question, the material interest ideology? Because it's your thought just that some people have less of a material interest in resistance. Yes, on one hand, mm -hmm. yes, it is that some people have less material interest yeah. in resistance, slash, have to radically reconceive of their interests in order to understand yeah, that yeah. liberation is in their interest, yeah. the dominant classes. Um, I'm also just thinking about the sort of like material basis for beliefs mm -hmm. and like the um the like day-to-day -day living out of your life that sort of impedes you from thinking otherwise and yeah. so what needs to change for people to see the world differently isn't just a reconceptualization or that's not like the only way or maybe even the first way but a really a shift in how you live. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. My husband is like back there really aggressively nodding since he likes this <laughs> question. Okay, yes, uh, okay, I love this question. Um, both parts of it. Um, so to the first part, this idea that like we need to see how our, our harm or gain. The Barbie, the, the Barbie movie is actually a great case here because I think that's sort of what's happening. Like it is forcing some men to confront this, right? Um, but a lot of men, as we know, they end up halfway through that process and they become men's rights activists. Um, <laughs> and actually, I'm really, really sympathetic to incels and men's rights activists. I teach this course called um, How to Make a Feminist. I'm changing it this semester so that men will actually enroll. <laughs> um, who needs feminism? I'm making it seem like I'm more skeptical than I am. Um, but, what I've noticed is like men will notice certain ways that they're harmed via their gender, right? Like it's true. If you're a, a, a man with children, you're less likely to get custody of your kids, right? You're going to get drafted if ever we're at war. That is a material disadvantage, but they stop at the, it's women's fault, right? And we need to get them to know it's patriarchy, which constructs you as being less fit as a parent because women are natural, you know, caring and nurturing. Um, but I do think, you know, with stuff like that, consciousness raising can be an effective tool. Like my how to make a feminist slash who needs feminism class is essentially a class that does consciousness raising. But to the other question, I think this is a really serious concern because people can't resist if they're so poor that they have to work four jobs and they can't possibly, you know, or you know, meet with people to work us. Um Part of me wants to say, yeah, we do actually just uh, fuck up capitalism and put that mm -hmm. to the ground, but it's really hard to burn an asteroid. Um, yeah, I mean, I need to, I definitely need to think about that some. I think very often people have to have a crisis point before they're willing to stop working to think about organizing. Uh, but I will say, I have a student working on consciousness raising among homeless populations. And like part of the thing she's thinking about is how like the less stable you are materially, the less able you are to engage in consciousness. And so the less able you are activism or persistence. And so one thing she's thinking is like, well, could that provide a kind of argument for you know, basic income? People need to have sort of a material baseline so that they can actually engage as full participants with their system. Um, but for me, even being able to have this conversation allows us to see sort of what the problem is. Like the problem is that our world is constructed in such a way that the people who need to organize are the least likely to be able to organize. And that might mean something 
for like people like us who have the privilege to go to grad school and stuff like maybe our task is to get a job at a factory so that we can like whisper in someone's ear hey you know this is bullshit right <laughs> like just so you know like you could fuck this up um I fantasize about this all the time it's like I worked at a grocery store I worked at TUI like you know, it, it is like you don't have time to think about what you're dealing with when you are working class. And I definitely think that is in some interest. Classes. Yeah. Okay, so um, I was going to ask both of the previous questions. There. <laughs> um, two things. Uh, Yeah, I guess they're sort of on the consciousness raising I, um, as a participant in the early consciousness feminist movement. Um, it was it was limited though in its impacts uh, first because it was women, but also because to make real changes, you can't just talk. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the material side, the idea that women were performing on a work in families is an important factor that needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I'm compensated for care. You know, it raises all kinds of broader perspectives. There. And the part that was addressed was principle. But my, my, the second part of my question um, or the second question really is that it seems very um, narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right about seeing things different, but you're putting the full weight on that. Whereas actual change requires a lot more. It requires structural change. It requires political, economic, social changes beyond the awareness that something of ideology and of perspective. And so in order to do that part though, um, you know, there are, I think what it can be effective is actually part of what you're rejecting, which is telling people how what they're already committed to has different implications from what they take it to have, which also gives the work of us political theorists of explicating like that the meaning of um, of, of freedom isn't just doing what you please, but as you know, involves conditions and condition. the universality that they're putatively committed to um, has radical implications. And so, in terms of making actual changes, I just don't think it's sufficient to get people to be aware that something's wrong, uh, that there's another world, that there's another perspective. And in fact, it's really a matter of convincing large numbers of people really be committed to what they claim are these very abstract notions that are you know just are given a neoliberal station but really they're kind of radical well, in that sense i think that it was a little unfair the critique of <laughs> yeah. king in that respect. he saw it is that the values were really radical um, and, and social and political yeah. so you're taking resistance the first stages um so here's why I guess I don't think that's enough and then I'll come back to the part about why I think conscious group is the most important first um I'm thinking of the people that I grew up with in this little town in Seeds, Florida, who were racist and who were perfectly fine with their values not including people like, like Martin Luther King's argument that that, that was never going to work because they're perfectly fine considering freedom in the way that they do it. They're perfectly fine considering men so that it excludes black people. They're perfectly fine um, with their very limited interpretation. I don't know how an argument like King's would work on that. But I think in I think a consciousness raising approach could work because one of the reasons I think those people were so committed to racism is that where I grew up, we were all poor. 
but at least you were still white. That was something, right? So that they could claim whiteness meant that they may have been poor just like us, but they were still better than us because they were wrong. Um, but that's harmful for them too, because it means that the only value that they have in this world is their whiteness. And to be committed to that kind of racial hierarchy isn't in their interest ultimately, because they have value as people just in virtue of being people, right? So when I when I make the case for this move to conscious race reason, part of it is that I think you can't be convinced to train that which you can. Oh, um, I agree. And what I was thinking, you know, with Black Lives Matter is part of the issue there is that so many white folks of the variety that I grew up with, I don't know how this, you know, I don't think this is true of white people generally, um, although it might be. But it was hard to make sense for some folks of what Black Lives Matter was saying. They were like, I don't see the there, there's no, there's, there's no war in Bossy City. Like there, there's no police brutality in this like nice little white suburb that I live in. And so they were like, they literally couldn't, I think, set all the problem. But white people have their own experiences with police officers. Um, and I think if you could get them to consciousness raise about the fact that like law enforcement can be because we can do it with the kind of authority and power we do, it can be completely arbitrary. You know, like. It is the case that innocent people can just be in the wrong spot at the wrong time and go to jail. And I think, you know, on average, white folks do have some understanding and familiarity with that. So getting them to start by thinking about how they experience these problems, too. And so this isn't about black and white people. It's about us dealing with unjust law enforcement, I think, provides a clearer path uh, for us to participate in resisting police brutality collectively. I don't think the end is consciousness raising. Definitely not the end. And I think you're absolutely right. Like one of the things Sarah Child mentions too is like there has to be a translation from this knowledge into that. Um, but I think we can't get the action piece done until people can see, yeah, these systems are out. They're hurting. Not just the people that I don't like, but they're hurting me too. And like eventually we can get to the, oh, actually I do like you and the ideologies that constructed us in such a way that we needed to be antagonistic. We can let those go now. Um, I don't believe in utopia, just to, be, to say that, but, but like, a dirty word. it's not a dirty word. I just, you know, yeah, don't know that I believe in utopia. Uh, but yeah, I am, I will say like, I'm in this process of writing the book now where I'm like sketching out the chapter summaries. And so I'm sort of thinking about how the pieces fit. Um, and it's like, I'm going to try and sell the book knowing full well that there's going to be more chapters beyond what I'm pitching them. Uh, so consciousness raising is where I've landed, but that's also because I'm trying to like experiment with consciousness raising as a, as a radical resistant practice. Now. Um, and I kind of need to see for myself, like what comes with that for my students. I think you really like that question. <laughs> and yes, I do give Martin Luther King on. <laughs> <laughs> And so much for your time. I think it's really interesting. And um, yeah, I have a comment also on her book. That comment. Um, and this are going to be all relevant to her question. That's great. Yes. So um, I think it's not just that they're a little dominant world. Dominant it's also that there are like, people who are simultaneously involved in the dominant world. And uh, well, the um, it's always it's most likely that one is uh, privileged um, in virtue of some aspects of their identity, you know, on the basis of my time. And uh, so that's the comment. And there's also a question related to that. Um, so I wonder how individuals like this different position in this system might complicate this paradox of oppression. So for example, if it's a privileged oppressed person that's resisting, then do you think this person or this paradox would still hold? Mm. Yeah, so what this tells me is I need to flush out official worlds of sense better, but that's I'm like so glad about these questions I'm getting though, because I gave this talk at Dartmouth, the the unrewritten one, and I just didn't like how it was constructed. And so the questions I got were as 
these are really great questions. I'm super excited. Like I'm on the right track. So when I say the official world of sense, um, I think there's a sense in which actually all of us right now are in the official world. Um, kind of because it's unavoidable not to be. Um, so I wonder, would it be helpful to talk about it in terms of like the hidden curriculum? No? Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what the hidden curriculum is, right? It's sort of, okay, so um, it's one of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of DEI because students of color, folks from low income backgrounds, first generation college students are unlikely to know sort of these rules that people whose parents and grandparents went to college knew. So like, if you are the descendant of people who've gone to college for the last several generations, if you know to go to office hours, you know what office hours are, you probably know how to keep your appointments and to study. But if you're new to the college environment, there are all these things that other people know that you don't, right? So like that knowledge that the people in the know know, the people who don't, that's kind of what I mean by the official. Um, so like when we look at a thing and we know how it's going to be interpreted by, we're sort of operating with this, this official world in mind. We know how other people using that same set of, um, but your point I think raises this one about intersectionality. So like how, how can someone who's privileged in one dimension engage in a form of resistance that doesn't still position them within that image. And I think the challenge for them is, is going to be the same as it is for everyone, figuring out what the contours of are so that you're not continuing to endorse it when you resist from sort of the perspective of your... Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, but then it's weird because I have to talk about Embody people that. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I think, yeah, so I don't think that affects the paradox at all. I do think it's, it's still, I, I do still think that it's largely problematic that for resistance to be taken seriously. I'm trying, if someone can help me figure out the language for this, I would really, I would owe you so much. But like, I'm hardcore obsessed with Game of Thrones. Like, I've read the books multiple times, can't watch the series because it's more rapey than the books. Um, but like resistance forces you to bend the knee. I can't stand that. Like, I don't like that I need to like for, for you to take me seriously as a moral agent, I have to say something, I have to do or engage in this practice that reinforces your dominance over me. For me, that's the paradox about resistance. I'm trying to reposition us as equals, and you're trying to ensure that I can't do that. For me, that's kind of the problem that the official world poses. We are really trying to change the positioning. We're trying to be creators of worlds together. That's what resistance, I think, when it's done right, aims for. But the official world tries to reassert its dominance by forcing those who engage in resistance to still acknowledge the dominance. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Yay. I'm so grateful that I um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is about so one half of your little band is this worry about the ledger that it's right? mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear more about potentials you see for like discourse across different resistant worlds. Mm -hmm. So not kind of the resistant world being legible to the dominant world, but eligibility problems that would arise between uh, different resistant worlds. If those kinds of problems still come up, I mean, mm. surely you know, a collective of, of all resistant worlds. Um, and then the second question, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about consciousness raising from a kind of pragmatic point of view, because I think I share your um, pull towards consciousness raising as this kind of neglected thing that we left in the past, but then I always come up against these limits of like what physical spaces do we do. Consciousness raising in the market. Yeah. I just want to yeah. Um, so I'll start with the last one first because I'm going to ask you some questions about the first question. Um, for anyone who's interested in consciousness raising, uh, my students just did this paper. They had mixed feelings about it, but like good mixed feelings. Gina Shooten, 
consciousness raising for higher education. Um, what she's trying to do in that paper is sort of draw the fact that like what consciousness raising, what education should do, right, is make you aware of the systems of oppression that particularly box out the working class or um, and sort of further accrue goods for those who get to go to college. And so she's so like, what we should be doing is consciousness raising for form. And then that leaves us open to this partisan charge that we're like indoctrinating the student. And so she tries to resolve this tension. Uh, I think it's pretty helpful though. Um, but for one, if you're trying to conscious raise, you should definitely sign up to be a part of Corrupt the Youth, the philosophy outreach program that I run. We have a chapter in New York and we teach at Eastside Memorial. Um, nope, Eastside Community High School uh, on the Lower East Side. The kids love it. The volunteer. Are any of you volunteers? But you will be. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that can be consciousness raising. I, you know, one of the reasons I created that program is because, yes, I wanted kids, frankly, like myself, who went to under source schools and didn't get to be exposed to philosophy. I wanted them to have philosophy because I think it's so empowering. But frankly, I also wanted my volunteers to see the kinds of places these kids have to go to school. Because when you can really appreciate it, like what it's like to be in a school where there are no you know, doors on the toilets, that will shape how you approach this whole education as this great you know, equalizer. No, it's not. It's really not. Um, so I think with consciousness raising, we have to get creative. And I definitely think it almost does happen in educational contexts. Um, one thing that I've been trying to do at my institution is create affinity groups. Um, I find that my students are scared to talk about race because they know that they're going to offend someone and they don't want to be like permanently marked as this bad person who said something racist. And they also don't want to hurt other people. Uh, and so I think even though affinity groups were complicated for intersectionality reasons, it is good for like white people to have a space where they can talk about their shit and for white people to have a space, you know, so what I was telling my kids is like, my students of color like really rag on the white kids. And I'm like, y'all have so many issues with transphobia and homophobia. You have literally no place to speak. Like y'all need to get together so that you can work that out. They need to get together so they can work out their racism. I think the reason these groups are important um, and are good examples of consciousness raising is sometimes you don't know you think or believe a racist or transphobic thing until you say it with a group of people you think you're going to be safe in. And you're like, oh, I didn't know I felt that. And now that I hear it, I realize I don't like how it's said. Right. Like we don't as collect, like we as human beings do not have enough space for that. Uh, and I think one of the benefits of the identity groups is it creates a space for that kind of honesty and self-reflect. Um, but I mean, I'm kind of dead ass serious about like, go get a working class job for a summer and just whisper in people's ears. Um, we've done things like this ourselves and uh or like volunteer you know like volunteering is great like work if you have a prison exchange program do that like teaching incarcerated people was one of the most transformative experiences for me just because I was sort of amazed by how much they took out of a class on feminism right um like we just have to find ways to be disruptive sometimes that's going to be small sometimes but I think if we're all doing our little piece, now I'm being naive here, but I don't care. I think if we're all doing our piece, like things will happen. All right. So to your question about discourse across different resistant worlds, can you can you give me examples of some worlds you have in mind? <laughs> uh, do I have one in mind? Yes, you could think of it in terms of like. A racialized group in America. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, coming back to the, the Rawlsman point, I do think there's supposed to be this organization with people who have similar grievances. And so you would want these racialized groups to be in contact. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just move on like black people in America versus like Africans in America. We got some. Uh, I don't know, like, if y'all know that, but there is a bit of tension and hostility between um, Africans in the United States and Black people in the United States. That's the kind of place where, like, we're each accepting some, like, ideal, like, official world nonsense about the other group. But it's not until we, like, 
put ourselves in contact with each other that we're going to be able to suss it. I think. Um, and so I do, I do worry that like part of what makes this task difficult is sometimes we're engaged in the oppression of others. Uh, so now I'm going to do the embody thing I said I didn't want to do. But like I think Asians in America and Blacks in America have tension too, right? Um, and this is a place where I think resistant discourses haven't been able to line up or overlap. And it's interesting because we are, you know, both considered minorities when it's convenient for the official world. But there are certain benefits for Asians, I think, that there aren't for Blacks. And so that in that gets some investment in the official world of sense from one group rather than the other. So that makes resisting together hard. So I think it's not until someone can sort of put these groups again in contact with each other in conversation with each other that they that we can draw out that like we're engaging and harming across groups because that's in the official world's interest. We leave the official world unchallenged because we're too busy attacking each other. Um, so a lot of my work is very much like. We need to be asking whose interest this is in. If we're fighting with each other, we need to be asking who benefits from this. And if it's not us, it's probably someone above us. And those are the people to be after. Does that answer your question though? Feel free to say no and to push me further. No, no, no. It does. So I guess my thought is that um, maybe after is so much about it. Oh, oh. Yes. I like yeah, okay. Legible in some respects and not in others. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question that's definitely related to. Uh, I wonder if in your book you not only stand on solve the, the paradox, but have, are you planning to discuss any historical examples of social radicality and consider uh, moving or successful resistance mm -hmm. and I think that might require Theorizing well, threshold, right? Like, to the extent that not give in any so called uh, dominant sense. And, you know, for instance, assuming that more broadly. Back a couple of decades, they are truly, and the ones that went for, <laughs> but it, but but basically, for the Zapatista movements in Mexico, there, I would think, are various examples to meet that that. Um, Threshold that are radical. Uh, I'm not sure, by the way, if their existence itself the paradox uh, at risk of whether they're. But anyway, here's a good question. But if you think there are such movements. Thank you. That's super helpful. Um, one of my students is potentially doing her research paper for my Yay for me, the research is being done for me. <laughs> um, actually, I do sort of have an example in mind um, that I think maybe could work. Uh, how many of you all are familiar with the Capitol Crawl? Okay. So Capitol Crawl was this act, you know, this, this piece of resistance activism undertaken by disability activists in 1991. The passage of the American with Disabilities Act was stalled in House committees. They were doing their normal nonsense where they try to add clauses for something else. And they were the disability activists were just done. So they showed up at the Capitol 
They tossed aside their mobility aids and they literally dragged themselves up 78 miles to the Capitol. I think that's a pretty good case because they don't try to appeal to our values of like all people are equal. And so to do that, we need to have accommodations. They were like, look at us. Look at how this looks. This is what it looks like to be a person with disabilities in a world that is not designed for us. And so it's sort of radically, uh, it was sort of a radical confirmation that did force people to sort of shift their epistemic perspective and start to see the world the way that people with mobility aids might. Um, so I definitely think there are successful movements, but I think when we look at the successful ones, they're going to be ones that don't kowtow to really try very aggressively to push against it. Um, and I mean, honestly, it worked. Like the ADA was passed like a month later, when it, you know, who knows how much longer it would have taken. Uh, so yeah, I do think they're there. Uh, and I like that you're pushing me to be a little more positive in the book so that I'm not just looking at examples where we didn't succeed, but also thinking about examples that went well or like what first Okay. Well, let's thank our speaker and we'll go to celebrate.